All right, y'all remember the iPhone came out and uh, Apple uh, announced, I think it was maybe with their second generation iPhone, uh, they announced Apple Maps. Does anybody remember using Apple Maps for the first time uh, instead of Google Maps or MapQuest or something like that? Um, well, if you don't, um, I remember using it for the first time and plugging it in. I think I was trying to get to a restaurant. Um, I think it was like a, a steakhouse or something like that, like uh, uh, Longhorn or something like that. Anyway, plugged it in and it was taking me. I was following the directions uh, and uh, making all these turns. It was in a, a city I wasn't, uh, I had no idea where I was going, so I needed the GPS. And so I'm following the GPS, and all of a sudden, I, I, you know, I pull up. I, it, it has me go down this street, and I'm like, there is nothing on the street, but it's telling me to go down there. And I, I pull down, and then it says, you have arrived. And I'm sitting next to an empty field. Um, and, and I, I'm like, all right, I don't see it anywhere. Now, about probably half a mile across the field on a different road, I see some lights and the restaurant. All right. Well, the experience with Apple Maps left a lot of people wanting more <laughs> because I got lucky and it directed me to an empty field. There was a lot of people that Apple Maps would take them to uh, inherently dangerous locations. Uh, in, uh, and, and people um, were experience, having kind of like that bad experience of, of it following the GPS uh, and it taking them to kind of a bad place or bad place. I mean, I was, I was lost. I had no idea where I was. It took me to an empty field. Um, I still had no idea how to get over to the restaurant. Um, but today we're going to be talking about what it means to trust Jesus when life takes an unexpected turn. Uh, when you feel like you've just ended up in the middle of nowhere. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. The reason why is because we live in a world where fear and uncertainty seem to dominate. Christians need to re be reminded of the steadfast presence of Christ in their lives. They need assurance. They need the assurance that Jesus is not only powerful enough to still the storms, but compassionate enough to care deeply about what they're going through. Because in life... If there's one certainty is that we are all going to face storms in our life. And we need to realize that Jesus' power over those storms reflects his sovereignty. And, and, and also when we're confronted, when we're confronted with situations like that, we also, we, we also tend to drift toward fear instead of faith. And so we need to be sometimes confronted with those fears so that it builds up our faith. And we need to be reminded consistently that Jesus cares about us and has compassion for us. Ultimately, uh, Mark 4, 35 through 41 is a message of hope, and that's where we're going to be this morning. We're continuing our series through Mark, following the King, and, and it tells us that this passage, that's a message of hope, it tells us that no matter what storms we face, we can trust in the one who is greater than that storm, who holds all things together, who invites us to rest in him. For a Christian walking through difficulties, this message is a lifeline that points them, points us back to Jesus, reminding us that he is with us. He is powerful and he is trustworthy. Mark 4, 35 through 41, this story is crucial for Christians because it speaks directly to the challenges of faith, fear, and trusting in God during life's storms. So if you have your Bibles, I, I invite you to pull them out. Uh, we're going to be in Mark 35 through 41. If you have your phones, you can... Uh, Open up your Bible app. 
as we, before we jump in to Mark 30, uh, 4, 35 through 41, I kind of want to remind us of where we've been previously, okay? Remember last week, we had a big chunk of scripture, right? We, we looked at 34 verses and it was, he was uh, teaching a large crowd, a very large crowd, and he had gotten to a boat sitting in the sea and he was preaching to them, right? And he told them a lot of parables. And so he spent all day teaching them. And what we find here is that on this day, evening had come, and he was tired. I mean, after a long day of teaching, who wouldn't be tired? And so he tells the disciples that let's go across to the other side. Now, the, I want to talk about a little bit of the, about the geography, uh, geography of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is not really a sea. It's just uh, it's a large freshwater lake. Um, and the Sea of Galilee has these steep hills and cliffs that encompass the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is, is 13 miles long by 7 miles wide, so pretty, pretty large lake. And it has these steep hills and cliffs that encompass it. And it makes it highly vulnerable to winds and sudden changes in the weather. So violent storms tend to develop on the lake often. And as cool air travels down from the northern Golan Heights area, it collides with the warm air basin of the lake, creating turbulent conditions that are intensified as winds force their way through ravines and canyons and the upper Jordan Valley. And in 1992, uh, a storm was generated that had 10-foot waves on the lake, and it caused flooding and damage to the city of Tiberias. Now, isn't it interesting, maybe God's providence here, that we're talking about the calm of the storm when this weekend or at the end of this week, all we've been hearing about is Hurricane, Hurricane Helene and the damage that is caused. I mean, we're, if, you, if you live in America, especially if you've ever lived near a coastline, you're very familiar with the damage that storms can cause. As, a, as an emergency manager in the Air Force, we, we, uh, and I was stationed on the coast, we, I lived through, you all remember the storm, Super Storm Sandy, that came through uh, many years ago? So I was stationed uh, at Langley Air Force Base, which is right on the coast of Virginia. And so up until about 12 hours before it made landfall, it was supposed to hit us directly. And then if you remember about 12 hours beforehand, it suddenly turned north and went up and hit New York. And you remember the devastation that New York had. Well, as we were preparing, we were expecting six, eight to ten, six to eight to 10 feet of storm surge where waves would be coming in and, and we were just expecting a massive devastation. That's why we evacuated all the planes, all the F-22s. They all, they all left. And uh, I was lucky enough to get stuck on base as an emergency manager. I had to operate the emergency operations center. Uh, our team did, and we took 12-hour shifts sleeping under desk. And what we went out and we, we filled sandbags for like a week preparing for this, uh, making a huge wall to protect our, our operations center so we could keep things running smoothly, both on the base and in the local area. So the, the, the reason why I'm telling you all this is because storms at sea or storms involving the sea can be massively devastating. And as we read through this, we're, we're going to see a storm like this. All right, let's read Mark 4, 35 through 41. I'm going to ask you to stand. Don't worry, it's much shorter than last week. I won't have you stand for five minutes. Uh, Let's read it. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side, and leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat. 
just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was, in, but he was in the stern, stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, "Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing?" And he woke and rebuked the wind and the sea, saying, "Peace, be still." And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You may be seated. The first thing I I want us to see in this passage, the first point this morning, is seeing Christ in the midst of our storm. I want us to see Christ in the midst of our storm. In Mark 4, 37, uh, it says a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat. So the the boat was already filling. And we've already talked about how, how devastating windstorms can, can be on, on a sea or a lake or an ocean like this. And, and this is one of those storms. A massive storm had popped up. And the reason why we know that this is a massive storm is because part of the disciples, several of them were very seasoned fishermen who had been fishing on this lake for generations. They had grown up fishing on the lake. They knew it very well. And so when this popped up, when this, warm, uh, this storm popped up and they're terrified and they're saying that the boat is filling up, we've got to, we, we, we see a great fear in them. We know that this storm was not just the average storm. But we also see that Jesus was in the boat the whole time, All right? So they're dealing with this fear. They're de- dealing with this fear because the storm has popped up and they're, they're terrified. They're trying themselves to, 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 um, to navigate the boat, to make sure it doesn't sink. And eventually they get to the point where they're like, man, we have to wake him up. We have to wake him up. And maybe they had forgotten about him in the back because he was sleeping. I don't know. Maybe they had gotten so distracted that they had forgotten about him. And they're like, man, we have to go to him. The crazy thing is that that Jesus was in the boat the whole time, right? Mark 4, 38, but he was in the stern, asleep on the the cushion. And they woke him and said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He was in the boat the whole time. They were struggling and fighting the storm And not trusting, not trusting in who he was, even even in in going to him and saying, hey, we're about to perish, you see, you hear the fear in their voice. But Jesus was sleeping in the stern. Now, this, this demonstrates two things for us, right? The fear, the fear that the disciples had and the lack of trust they had but also the trust that God had, that Jesus had, in the one who had sent him. He knew why he was there. He knew, he knew what his end was. He knew what his mission was. And so he trusted in God that no matter what the winds were doing outside, that he could rest in the Father, even amongst a great storm. So a couple months ago, I was driving. This reminded me of, of, of driving up here. Um, it was one of the trips I'd gone down to Texas to grab some of our stuff. Uh, and I'd hooked up a trailer to the back of it. I left Texas around 6 p.m. And I was like, I'm just going to drive all night. I'll get in around 4, 4.30 in the morning. And so I'm driving through Oklahoma um, at like 2 o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden, actually, I think maybe I'd crossed into Kansas. That doesn't matter. 
I'm driving up. I'm driving up to Kansas. And all of a sudden, I, I'm getting these weather alerts on my phone. Big storm coming through. Big storm coming through. If you're in the area, find shelter. And I'm like, I, there's, there's nothing around. I mean, I'm in the middle of Oklahoma or Kansas, and there's nothing around. And if once you hit Kansas, you can't get off because Kansas has decided that they only need an exit every, like, 50 miles. <laughs> and, so, and so I've got nowhere to go. And I'm looking at the weather, I'm pulling up the map, and I'm seeing this massive storm sweeping across the entire state. Okay, I'm starting to get a little bit nervous because I'm hauling a trailer in a truck that may or may not break down on me. All right. And, and I'm, I'm just like, okay, well, I'm going to trust God. He's going to get me there. I'm going to keep driving. Then all of a sudden, the sheet of rain just comes over. I'm telling you, I could not see out of my window. I had the, I had the windshield wipers going full blast, and I couldn't see more than five feet in front of me. So I slow down, put my blinkers on, and I'm, I'm going like 10, 15 miles an hour. I'm looking for that one light, that, that one reflective light that is, uh, is on the side of the road to tell me that I'm still on the road. And I'm following that one light after, you know, looking, at, looking for that light. All right, <laughs> looking for that reflection. That's all I'm doing. I can't see anything. And the storm was raging. Maybe you've gone, maybe y'all have been caught in one of those storms before, and y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. I can't see anything out in front of me. The storm is raging around me. But inside my truck, it was super calm, right? I, I wasn't experiencing the storm. In fact, I had an audio book on, Right? I had an audiobook, and so I was listening to an audiobook on there. And I'm just sitting there gripping the steering wheel as tight as I can in the calmness of my truck, listening to audiobook while a storm is raging around me. And and that's kind of I like that's kind of how as I read through this, I was like, man, it's kind of how I felt. I was I was just like, I was like, all right, I'm just gonna trust God that He's gonna get me there. I've got nowhere else to go. And, and I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to look for that next reflector. And I'm just going to keep going. It's easy to forget that in storms of life, and in this storm, it's easy to forget that in this storm, in Mark, that Jesus never left the disciples. Right? Because if, if you read this Mark 4.37, where where the waves are breaking against the boat and, and the boat's already fill, filling and the disciples are, are fearing for their life, you've got to be thinking, where is Jesus in this, right? How could, how could he be asleep in the stern, right? Where is he? Why isn't he helping them? But that's so often how, how we react and that's how the disciples reacted, But in fact, he was right there in the middle of it. And sometimes it feels like God is is silent or even asleep in our struggles. But the reality is that his presence is constant. His presence in our life is constant. And even when we can't see him or feel him, he is there. In our storms, whether they're financial or relational or personal, we need to see Christ in the midst of that storm. We need to remember that Jesus is in that boat with us. As, as, we, as we fear for our lives, as waves are, are, are threatening to overcome our situation, we need to remember that Jesus is in the boat with us. If you're a believer, we need to remember that Jesus is in the boat with us. Remember I talked about how how there's there's two different kind of pictures. We have the pictures of the disciples who are reacting in fear, and then the picture of Jesus who's, who's sitting there 
resting in the midst of this chaos around him? Well, Jesus' rest in the storm reveals to us his control. While the disciples were panicking, Jesus was asleep. And we ask ourselves, how could he sleep? We ask ourselves, how could he sleep? And we oftentimes, when we're struggling with our own storm, we ask, why am I not hearing from God? Why do not I not feel, feel his presence? Why, why is he not actively helping? The reason why he... The reason why he didn't help the disciples with this storm is because he knew that the storm doesn't have the final word. And in our life, we need to understand that the storms, the struggles, the trials that we go through don't have the final word. Often, in fact, we're, we're uh, often the fact is that we're frantic. And, and, and us being frantic shows that, that we're trying to control things that we were never meant to control. Jesus, instead, he rests in, he rests in the control of God. And Jesus' rest is an invitation for us to find peace in his sovereignty. The fact is, is that fear, the fear that we see in, in the fear that we see in the disciples in, in this passage and the fear that we experience when we're, when we're dealing with our own storms, it exposes our lack of faith. So that's our next point this morning is that fear exposes our lack of faith. The disciples' fear revealed their lack of understanding of who they were with. They were, we know, we know that they were with God, the creator. We can look back and say, like, definitively that the disciples were sitting in the boat with God, the creator of the universe. And so their fear demonstrated that they did not understand who they were with. Because if I'm in a boat, if I'm in a boat with literally the God who made everything, there is nothing that I should be fearing. But so often we do. But so often we do. I love this Charles Spurgeon quote that he, he had in one of his sermons. He says that half of our fears are the result of ignorance. Half of our fears are the result of ignorance. Half of, half of our fears are, are the result of us being ignorant of how great and big God is. We love to put God in our box, in, in the box that we create for him, in, in the time that we create for him. We only think about God on Sunday morning when we come to church, and, and it's between the hours of 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. Those are the hours that I'm allowed to think about God or spiritual things. Outside of that, on Tuesday, on Tuesday night, when I've had a hard day at work and, and, and I come home and um, the family's crazy and I get in a fight with my wife and, and, and I'm struggling with, with alcohol ad addiction and, and any time that those happen, we're not thinking about God and how he is in the boat with us our ignorance is that we put God in a box. We limit God to a time frame during the week. 
The disciples' fear also made them question if Jesus cared for them. We see this because when the storm hit, they freaked out. One commentator put it this way, that they knew he possessed divine power, having seen him perform miraculous healings for many others. Yet when their own lives were at stake, the inadequacy of their faith was exposed. The disciples' fear made them question if Jesus cared for them because when the storm hit, they freaked out. They had seen him do miraculous signs, healed, expelled demons, and, and yet when it came time for them to trust in Jesus, they were found lacking They lacked faith. They questioned Jesus. Don't you care if if we drown? Don't you care if we drown? That we are perishing. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And this is something that we do with our own life. So oftentimes when we're confronted with our own storm, and, and we don't feel like God is there with us. Even though he is, instead of running to him and seeking him and desiring him, we become accusers. And, and we say, because I don't feel your presence, then you must not care about me. Because you have not solved this miraculously, then you must not care about me. And that's why we're reminded consistently through the New Testament that God will will be with us. And in Hebrews 13, 5 through 6, uh, the author of Hebrews believes that this is again needed to be reminded of. That Jesus said that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so that we can confidently say that the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do? uh, What can man do to me? We need this reminder because in our fear, in our fear, we oftentimes begin to question if Jesus cares for us at all. But his promise is that he will be with us, that he is right there in the boat with us, and that he will never leave us, he will never forsake us, and that there is no reason for us to fear. Fear has a way of exposing the places where we trust ourselves more than God. Fear has a way of doing that. Does God, we ask that question, does God care? Maybe you're struggling today. Maybe you're here today um, and and you're struggling with with a sickness or, or you're struggling with finances and you're asking that question, does God even care? And that question, oftentimes, it comes from a heart that is focused on self preservation rather than surrendering to God's plan. And when we seek our own solutions over seeking God, we end up spinning our wheels. And this is true in our own salvation as well. Oftentimes, we want to do something to earn our salvation. Oftentimes, we, we want to do something that we, have, we feel like we need to participate in some way for our own, our own salvation. Because we fear that if we have not done something, then that will not be adequate enough. And that's not trusting in what the Bible says, that we are saved through faith in Christ. And, And it is only through Christ, only through Christ, by the grace of God, that we have salvation.
And that, that there's nothing that we can do. And so our fear, we like to spin our wheels and, and figure out something to do. And our fear, that's what happens. And we want to participate. But God is saying, rest in me. You can trust me. I am trustworthy. And you can rest in me. And there is nothing that you need to do to earn your salvation. And as we seek our own solutions over God, over seeking God, Paul, on the flip side, he expresses a confidence in God that we should have. Paul tells us that we should have a confidence in God. In Romans 8, 38 through 39, he says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Faith calls us to relinquish control and rest in God's sovereignty. Jesus didn't rebuke the disciples for waking them up. He rebuked them for their fear. They wanted control. But the storms remind us of how little control we have. Have you ever thought about how fragile human life is? Usually, usually we think about this when we know somebody who has passed recently. We start thinking about how fragile life is. How in an instant, your life could be gone. You could, I, I don't wish this on anybody, but you could literally, you could leave here, come out to this, driving out of this parking lot. You could be turning right or turning left and a car come flying up the road and sideswipe you and you'd be gone. Just like that. You could have an aneurysm that you have no idea about and one minute you're alive, and the next second you're dead. And that happens. Heart attacks, strokes, the fra fragility of life is something that we don't like to, to think about. But it demonstrates to us how little control we actually have. And, and when storms come up, it also reminds us of how little control we have and how much control that God has. True faith means surrendering our need for control, trusting that God sees the whole picture while we just see the storm. Right? Trusting that, that God has the, the satellite view of Hurricane Helene, right? He sees the storm that you're going through, right? He sees all of it. Kind of like the, the satellite images of storms, right? He sees all of it. While we're in it, we only see the sheets of rain that are pelting us and the, the lightning and the wind, he sees all of it. He knows, he knows how big the storm is. He knows the cause of the storm. He knows what's going to happen in the storm. He also knows the calm that is going to come after the storm. He is in control. He has the whole picture. John MacArthur in his, in his commentary says this about, about this passage. He says that clearly Jesus intended to teach the disciples a critical lesson here, that they could trust him even in the most treacherous and helpless situations. They could trust him in even the most treacherous and helpless situations. Jesus wanted them to learn this, and he wants us to learn this. And the reason that we can set aside control and rest in Christ is because that Jesus has power over the storms of life. We see this in his response. They wake him up. They ask him, do you not care that we're perishing? 
And his response is to wake up and rebuke the wind and say to the sea, peace, be still. Jesus spoke. Jesus' Jesus' word, his words command the winds and the waves. And Jesus spoke and the storm ceased. There was no struggle. The wind and the waves didn't debate with him. They obeyed him. The same voice that created the universe commands every force that comes against us. Remember we talked about how Jesus' miracles are different than, than the common faith healing miracles that we, we see today in false teachers and, and, other, and others. When God does a miracle, when God does a miracle, it is instantaneous. When Jesus spoke, when, when God does a miracle, he, he didn't say, he doesn't say to the, the demon-possessed man, hey, in three to six months, the demon will come out of you. Or, or your blindness will, will progressively get better over the next couple of years. Come back to me if, if it doesn't work, right? He speaks and, and they are instantly healed. He speaks and the de- demons obey him and they are instantly cast out. And we see here again that Jesus speaks and instantly the waves and the wind cease. I'm not talking about how, I'm talking about the clouds part, they disappear and the waves become calm. The immediacy of his control, the immediacy is important for us to recognize. And it's a callback to Genesis 1 and creation where, where God creates with a word. He calms, the, he calms the storm with a word and instantly it disappears. And so we can trust him because his power is absolute. The very elements that terrified the disciples were silenced by the word of the one who made them. In a commentary, it says that fear is, is the natural response for sinful human beings to begin, uh, for, uh, for human beings to exhibit whenever they are in the presence of God. The realization that the creator was in their boat was far more frightening than any terror that they might face outside their boat. We see this in, in verses 41 that, that they, they leave from being terrified of the storm to being terrified of the person who is in the boat. Because, because this miracle, there have been many, many scholars that look at these weather miracles that Jesus does, and, and they believe they're complete fiction because they don't believe that there's any way possible they could have happened because they don't have faith that the creator of, of the universe can dictate what the weather does. But there is no scientific explanation that can make sense of any of this. And so for a first century Jew who just thought that they were going to die in a storm, to have a guy walk up, wake up, and, and tell, tell the wind and the waves, peace, be still, that, and, and it obeys him, that in itself has got to be terrifying. And so they walk from being fearful of being destroyed to being fearful of the person that they're in the boat from. And that's a natural response. And I'm going kind of, to kind of get on a soapbox here real fast. It'll be real quick. There are many stories many movies that have been made recently, many books that have been written about people visiting heaven, people being visited by angels, 
And, and I'm going to tell you that if the first response of that person, if their story does not begin with them being terrified, with them being fearful for their life, that story is not true. Because when you look at those stories in, in the face of every encounter with God or his agents in Scripture, every single, every single encounter with God or his agents begins with fear. Fear and worship. And so when you're, when you're putting everything in culture through the lens of Scripture, which, which Scripture tells us that we should be doing, right? When you're hearing stories about how I, I visited, I, I was in a trance and I visited God and it was so great and it was amazing and there's no reference of, of fearing for their life or, or worshiping the, the greatness of God, man, they are blowing smoke or they're not visiting God. Because fear, fear of God and worship is the natural response, and it's the only response that we see in Scripture. Every time when people are confronted with, with God and his agents, that is the response. Okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox. Proverbs 1 7 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. This is the beginning of where the disciples are fearing the Lord. This is the beginning of, of them recognizing who they're with. They had seen it before, but, but this, is, this is one of the first points in Mark, and I think Mark makes a point of establishing that they were fearful of him. To demonstrate us that Proverbs 1, 7 is, is true. And it, it's, it should be true for us. And notice that it, it doesn't say that it is all knowledge. It says that it is the beginning of knowledge. Jesus' power over the storm points to his power over all struggles in our life, including sin and death. If Jesus can calm a literal storm, how much more does he have the power over the storms of sin and death? The storm on the Sea of Galilee is a picture of the greater storm we face, sin and separation from God. Yet, through the cross, Jesus took on the storm of God's wrath, and he calmed it for us. And we have peace with God because Jesus had, has already stilled the most dangerous storm. This doesn't mean that Christians will never face trials. In fact, we will face trials. Just because he has the power over all struggles in our life doesn't mean that we will not face trials and struggles. Jesus is very upfront about that. That if, if, you, if you follow me, you will face trials. Some of you in this room or maybe watching online might be dealing with a trial right now. It might be a sickness that you were just diagnosed with and you haven't told anybody about. It might be a long-term medical issue that you've had for years and you're struggling to understand why God has you going through it. It might be a loss of a loved one. It might be an addiction that you have. You might, you might, be, you might have an, an alcohol addiction or a pornography addiction or, or a gambling addiction, and every time you go back to it, you feel shame. Because you feel like you aren't trusting God. The fact is, is that we face trials and struggles in our life and storms in our life. It might be that, that you're struggling with your finances and, and you don't know how next week you're going to pay your bills. 
But we can rest confidently that God is in control, that Jesus has power over all these storms, all these struggles in our life. We can live confidently in the promises of Scripture, that He cares for us and that He loves us. In Romans 8, 28, it says that we know that those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. And that is so that we can do, as we rest in that promise, we can go to the promise that is found in Philippians and the instructions that is found in Philippians 4 that says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts, your minds in Christ Jesus." Harry Emerson Fosdick, who is a, who is a pastor and, and author, wrote this, that fear imprisons, faith liberates. Fear paralyzes, faith empowers. Fear disheartens, faith encourages. Fear sickens, faith heals. Fear makes useless, faith, faith makes serviceable. And most of all, fear puts hopelessness in the heart of life while faith rejoices in its God. In the midst of all of our struggles and storms and everything, instead of turning to fear, and instead of turning to fear, we need to turn to faith. Seek and desire Jesus. Because faith Faith is what brings about the peace of God. Faith in Christ, faith in his ability is what brings about the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. It is how you can go through a storm. And I'm sure you've met people like this, where life is raging around them. And yet they have a stillness about them. And when you ask them, they say, it's because I trust, trust in Christ. All of this, all of this, he's got in control. Christ is, I, I want us to see that Christ is present in our storms and that our fear demonstrates our lack of faith and that Jesus has the power over storms in our life. Matthew, or Mark, that'd be weird if we were in Matthew. Mark 4, 35 through 41, challenges us to trust Christ in the midst of life storms. His, he is present with us. He calls us aware, away from fear and into faith and holds all power over every trial we face. So next time, Next time, or if you're in a storm right now that is rising in your life, remember that Jesus is in your boat, that he is sovereign over the storm, and he is inviting you to trust in him. Let's pray.